coming up on this week's Outdoor Elements. Nobody does winter like Love Creek County Park in Michigan. Today on Outdoor Elements, we're gonna get some tips on how to identify trees by their winter twigs. We're also gonna go cross country skiing and check out some equipment. But first we'll try out a new trend in biking. Outdoor Elements is presented in partnership with the St. Joseph County Parks Department, Cardinal Native Plant Nursery, the Indiana Department of Natural Resources and the Indiana State Parks. Around the corner from my house, there's a mountain bike trail. And in the last couple of years, I've been seeing more and more of these bikes with these big fat tires that look like they came off of a motorcycle. I've been wondering what this is all about because I'm seeing them more and more often. And we're here at Love Creek County Park in Berrien Springs with Kip Miller, who, where they rent these bikes. And he's gonna tell us a little bit about these bikes. What's the deal with this thing? Why is there a big tire on this? Well, this is a, it's called a fat bike or a fat tire bike, but the big fat tire allows a person to ride these bikes in looser conditions than you could on a mountain bike. Snow or sand or gravel, um, it just gives you more flotation with that big wide tire. And compared to this mountain bike, yeah, that's quite a, a difference there. So we were out on the snow a little bit and we were riding around a little bit better. Now this is not gonna work so well, it's gonna maybe tear things up a little bit. Right, it'll just cut through the snow and you won't be able to ride. And You know, years ago, this was kind of considered a fat bike when yeah. mountain biking <laughs> first originated. Um, but, but later on, people developed fat bikes to ride in additional conditions that even a mountain bike uh, would not work in. Does this big fat tire also give you like some cushion? It does a little bit uh -huh. um, because you ride with these in a really low tire pressure, especially in the snow. Yeah. So, um, but it's not only for snow. They're, they're a lot of fun, even on like a regular mountain bike trail in the summer, spring or fall. And that tire does give you some cushion. You can just roll right over oh, yeah, rocks and stuff, roots yeah. and things like that that you might have to try to dodge around on a regular mountain bike. So you started to talk a little bit about where um, the origination of fat tire bikes, and you notice you've yeah. been seeing them yeah. more and more. And so have I. Even just down on the roads, sometimes I see them, although they're really noisy on the roads. Yeah, they, yeah, a lot of tire on a, the pavement. Yeah. Um, so where did fat tire biking start? And you know, how has it kind of progressed? Well, I first saw fat bikes uh, in Alaska over a decade ago. And uh, so I knew they started in Alaska, but I, you know, I did a little bit of just research for this. And uh, it turns out that at the same time, the whole fat tire idea was being developed in Alaska. It was also being developed in New Mexico for riding in sandy desert washes and canyons and things like that. So basically the same idea, okay. yeah. um, a wide tire with more flotation. Okay. to allow to ride in snow, ice, um, gravel, or sand. And I'm kind of curious, does it, like, obviously this is an adult size bike, but right. you can get them in different yeah, sizes? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. You, I've seen kids' bikes, you know, it's a smaller diameter fat bike, but still okay. a very, very fat bike. Yeah. Well, we've, you know, been out biking and trying, trying the bikes today, and we're going to ride a little bit here in a little bit, but I'm guessing the dressing there's probably a little bit of an art to that because yeah, it's well, it's a basically aerobic, right? we do have uh, we do have a fat bike trail here at Love Creek, and we have the fat bike rentals. People come in on their own, but one of the mistakes that I often see from the people that are renting who just simply haven't done it before is they overdress. Yeah. Um, you definitely you're going to warm up when you're out there fat biking. So uh, if you come in with snow pants on and a big thick down coat. Um, you're going to get overheated and then you unzip and then because you've been sweating you get cold and it's miserable So kind of dress sort of like I have here with uh, just sort of uh, some th thin layers that you can shed if you need to and just Because you really should wear a helmet one thing you really want to avoid is a big thick hat like this with the ball on top yeah. You just won't get the helmet over it's that so fit. a thin kind of an ear band or hat like you can yeah. see that I have under this yeah. works pretty good okay. but basically now, the same kind of clothing you would wear if you went out for you know a really brisk winter walk or a winter run, cross-country skiing, yeah. uh, something that'll keep you a little warm, 
but not too warm. Okay. I know with mountain bikes, they have there are mountain bikes in all kinds of price ranges. I've seen mountain bikes that cost more than my car, and then cheaper ones that you can get locally. Is there a good price range with these? Are these can you get these at a lower price like yeah, that? It's the same thing as yeah. like with other bikes. There's a range of pricing, um, so you can um, you know you can spend less and you can spend more yep. with uh, with a fat bike. You touched a little bit about the fact that you can ride these on mountain bike trails or in the snow, but are there conditions where you shouldn't be on the trails? Well, if it's really muddy, you shouldn't be riding trails on any bike because the bike, even a fat bike, can make ruts in the mud, mm -hmm. and then that eventually causes erosion on a trail. Uh -huh. So you shouldn't do that. And also, I guess, too, right, if the ruts dry out, then you've got really kind of uneven. Right. Yeah, and another time, of, for instance, here at Love Creek, when this, we actually groom the snow to ride on the fat bikes when we have good snow. But when it gets real warm, if you ride on that snow, it will leave ruts in the snow. Then if it freezes, the ruts are in the frozen part and nobody can ride it. Yeah. So that's another, that's another situation where we ask people not to ride on the trails. Okay. So if people want to try this out, they can actually come out here to Love Creek Park and to do it. So you can rent these bikes out here? That's correct. Uh, several years ago, we developed uh, a new fat bike trail for the winter time. Uh, in addition to the cross-country ski program we have, the trail is separate. And uh, as a part of that program, we also have bikes that people can rent, just like we do for our ski rental, you can rent the skis. So we do have rental bikes available in adult sizes, so people can come out and they can just check the Berrien County Parks website for current conditions and information on pricing and that sort of thing. And that usually happens in the winter? Right, we usually have the bikes on site um, November to early April. And you can ride them when there's no snow, but it's when there's snow and we're grooming the trail, that's when it's really uh, sort of a, a novel, yeah, different novelty. kind of an experience, and that's when it's the most popular. Great. All right, well, I'm up for a little ride. Let's and go. It's a little kind of a cloudy winter yeah. day today. I bet it's gorgeous out here in the sunshine, and we've got some great sunshine footage of some riding out here, too. I wish we were here on that day, but it, it, this will do. <laughs> this will do. do. At least we're outside. Yeah. So we're outside. Yeah, thanks a lot. You bet. Thanks. A lot of us remember doing leaf collection projects when we were little or maybe helping our kids with leaf, leaf collection projects now. And leaves are a good way to get to know trees. You might look at the lobes or maybe it doesn't have lobes. But it's a little trickier in the wintertime when there aren't any leaves on the trees. Fortunately, we're here with Pat Underwood from Love Creek County Park and he's going to tell us a little bit about how we can identify trees by their twigs. Now you've got a twig there. What are some of the things, and we don't have lobes or the edges of the leaves to look at, what are some of the things we can look at on a twig to help us distinguish it from other kinds of trees? All right, well there is kind of a geography, if you put it, if you want to say it that way, about twigs. Different things you can look for, so we'll just start out with a few of those. On the end of most trees, you've got the terminal bud. All right, okay. this is where the, the, the twigs on a tree are going to get longer. Kind of a spiky looking thing on this yep. one. Looks a little artichokey. All right different scales on there. Next we would have, if you go down a little bit, you get what's called the leaf scar. These little, they're different shapes sometimes, but that's where the leaf fastened onto the twig. Sort of a half moon or crescent mm -hmm. shape there on this yep, one. Yep, a lot of times yeah. it's, it's sort of half moon crescent, yeah. Within the leaf scar, there's little dots. Those are the vascular, or the, the water tubes, so to speak, that went into the leaf. Okay. To, to help feed the leaf. Nourish it during that, mm -hmm. well, during its growth. Yeah. yeah. On the sides, because you got the terminal bud, on the side you've got the lateral buds. This is where new branches are going to grow. So this would, a new branch would grow out here. So this is a little miniature version of that kind of looks mm -hmm. like. Yep, a little bit smaller. Great. So those are all unique to this species though, and we can find other ones that have different versions of that. Maybe they're a little pointier, maybe they're a little skinnier. So we're going to look around on the trail here a little bit to see what else we can find. Let's go. All right. So we started with this one. 
which uh, is a buckeye, and it has that more blunt, rounded uh, bud to it there at the end. But that's how we kind of distinguish them, is comparing all those different features. So which, which one do you have here? Our next one is an American beech twig. And you know, as naturalists, we like to, I like to really point out things that people maybe have not noticed before, the little details yeah. and things. And that's what, what you're really talking about when you're talking about buds, just little details. This is the, the, the beach again. It has very pointed, almost like little cigars for its buds. Oh, that's a good thing to remember, little yeah. cigars. It's kind of nice. That's one good way to help, rem help people remember things is kind of compare it to something else that they know. Good. So it has the same, it has scales like this mm -hmm. one did, but it's much more elongated. So I like to remember that cigar thing. Yeah. And by the way, these scales, that's what helps protect a, a, a bud during the winter time. It Great. keeps the moisture in there so they don't dry out in the winter. And another thing people don't realize is that these buds are being produced during the summertime while the tree is still growing. So these buds are ready to go by the time a tree will turn dormant for the winter time. Great. We're going to get back on the trail and see what else we can find. Sounds good. We're here next to another tree one to identify, but it's a little tricky up there. But we've found a few twigs and buds from smaller species. Uh, so what can you tell us about this one? Well, this one, Hoosiers will know really well. This is the Indiana State tree, oh, yeah. the tulip tree. One of our prettiest flowering trees. Oh, yeah. Real nice. And as we see, we talked about the buds are different from each species. You can see on the tulip tree, the bud only has two scales, unlike that beech, which has Okay, yeah, they, they always had a bunch of overlapping ones, and then we've just got, almost looks like a clamshell yeah, here. Yeah, exactly. And we say this one looks like a little bit like a duckbill. Oh, well, duckbill, that's even better. <laughs> so yeah, another kind of a little trick to find these. Excellent. And what are these little dots trees. that we have all along our, our Yeah, the dots, there? they're little corky openings okay. called lenticels. And what this does, remember trees have to breathe. Mm -hmm. You know, not only through their leaves, but also in the wintertime through their, their, their twigs and things. So you've got these lenticels which allow air to get into the, the soft inner bark. Great. Let's go look for some more. Okay. So there are a few kinds of hickories that you can find in our area, and this is a bitternut hickory. And we're, we have one where we're, it's, there's branches low enough where we can actually see some of these features that you're talking about, and you have one there as well. What can distinguish this from some of the other trees? Well, this is one of my favorite trees. This has the only tree that I know of that has bright yellow buds. And the closer we get to springtime, as the buds grow, getting ready to, you know, to, to pop the leaves and and f perhaps flowers, they get even more yellow. They're already pretty distinctive, so mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to, to trying to pay attention to that when things warm up a little bit and see those turn bright yellow. Yeah, and this is another one that only has two scales that go over. It's yeah. a little, it's not quite as duck billy, duck bill looking as the um, tulip tree, but it still just has the yeah. two scales. See that. Well, let's go on to one of my favorite trees next. All right. Now, so far we've been looking at buds that were leaf buds. But this one is a little bit different. We've got some other things to look at on this one, right? Right. This is one of everybody's favorite tree, the flowering dogwood. Big and white flowers with big four petals yeah, on it. Yeah, yeah the beautiful. petals come, the flowers actually open up first, yeah. and then the leaves will come later. So the buds for the flowers are very much ready already, um, ready, ready to go. And as you know, as a naturalist, you know, you get, these things are just loved by everybody. Yeah. But you've got the big flower bud that looks a little bit like an onion. Oh, it does, kind of a good way to remember this one. Whereas our other buds have been sort of flat shaped or sort of cylindrical, this is kind of squatty looking. Yeah, and you can see where it's kind of almost ready to open up at the very ends already. And this well, is one thing that fruit farmers have to be aware of. If their buds open too soon during a warm period of time in the winter, then it freezes. You know, so, boom. So they've got to be good. real aware of the buds. Well, next yeah. we want to go check out uh, a plant that might be good for a little snack. So let's see what yeah. that's all about. One of my favorite things when I'm out exploring the wilderness is learning about things that I can eat and learn about survival things. Right. And I guess this is something that we could actually eat. So we want to identify it really well. So what can you tell us about how we identify this? Okay, well this is the American basswood. Usually you can tell they have double trunks. Good way to tell them from the distance. But also what will catch your eye is the basswood buds are bright red. And they look, look kind of juicy. And they'll get even bigger and more juicy looking as we, course, we get closer to spring. But you can actually eat, eat these. I heard, of a, I heard of a boater up in the upper Great Lakes who got stranded on an island. And the way he survived for a number of days was eating gull eggs and basswood buds. All right, are we gonna try so some? Let's try one. All right, I've never tried them before. You can have the big one okay. on the end. All right. All right. <laughs> 
somewhat of a nutty flavor. Yeah, kind of chewy. Not too bad. And too bad a lot of a kind of a, in, a lot of moisture on the inside, which again is is um, preparing leaves to grow. Well, that's neat. That's a great way to want to know that. I mean, if you looking for a reason to need to identify them, eating them is you don't want to eat the wrong one. So that's good right. to know that. Well, right. thanks a lot for showing all these tips on how to identify these buds how to distinguish these trees in the winter. That's been very helpful. I can't wait to my next winter hike when I go out and look for these things and try some of this on my own. Well, you're welcome, Vince. It's fun to look for little details that you may not have noticed before. So Thanks. You like to do that. Sycamore trees have really unique bark. Sometimes its nickname is the camouflage tree because the green, thin, brown, scaly bark actually peels off, and that's normal. It's a healthy tree. It really stands out in a winter landscape. It's really prominent. Another thing that's prominent on a sycamore tree in winter are the interesting seed balls that hang from the branches. And they're actually a favorite food of some birds who might be foraging in our area in winter, like goldfinches and flocks of red poles. Sycamore trees tend to grow in places where there is a lot of moisture in the soil so as you're driving around near a lake or a river or a stream, look for the camouflage tree. Whew, all right. Well, it's a little sticky today because it's a warm winter day, but we're going to talk about cross-country skiing with Blair Zordell, who is a cross-country skiing enthusiast. We're going to get our skis off. Why don't we do that? And then we right. can talk about some of the gear. All right. So let's talk a little bit about why you like to cross-country ski. We're out here at Love Creek County Park. I know it's one of your favorite places yes, to is. ski. I love but you it. ski all over the place, right? Yes, I, this is my local ski area, but I skied all over Michigan, Wisconsin. I'm actually going to Norway this year to ski in yes. the World Masters. So uh, this is my training area and it's one of my favorite spots. Why do you like to ski? I love it because you be outside. I just love to be outside and enjoy nature. And uh, for the fitness factor too, I'm getting older, but it's always nice to stay in shape <laughs> yep. like this. And, uh, and it's just really nice to enjoy the, just enjoy the outdoors in this park like this. And I'm also a photographer, so I always will have a camera on me. If you see some nature or some you know, deer or just pretty sights and take a few photos of things and right. things like that. And so, we're actually going to share some great yeah. GoPro footage that you took on a beautiful <laughs> sunny day yes. out here at Love Creek so you could kind of um, see what the trails look like on, in the sun. Yeah. Uh, and then you and I um, uh, got to ski a little bit ago right. and just came in from that. We saw some really fun stuff like a possum tracks and mouse yeah. tracks. So mm -hmm. that's super fun. Yes. Let's talk about the equipment, right? So yes. if I'm a beginner, I don't know anything about skis. Look, mine don't look really short. And yours look really <laughs> long. What's what's the deal with the skis? How do they well, work? Well, these are so just some no wax skis. These are mm -hmm. a real fun pair of skis to own. You don't have to really do a whole lot of maintenance on them. You can see they've got a lot of grip right here in the kick zones. You can um, ski very well with these and get get a lot of grip, and uh, they're just a lot of fun to ski on. Let me ask you about that, because the, the scales are kind of here in the arched or the curved part of the ski, yep. and then this is smooth, so what's the purpose of that? These are your glide zones, and when you put your weight on one ski, you'll just mash this into the snow, and that'll give you some grip, and so that'll give you a kick. You're actually shifting your weight Shift. when you push down, right. this grips on the snow, yep. and then when you kind of let up, this glides the tips and the tails. When you put, you put your weight on both skis at once, um, they'll, the grip will go away and you can glide down glide the hill. Down the hill. Yes. And then if we turn them around, let's take a look here at the bindings, right? Because if somebody's a downhill skier, these look really different as do the boots that we're wearing, right? Yes, they're a lot more flexible boot than a downhill. You can see my toe, how flexible yeah. they go. And that's so you get a good grip and a good plant on the, on the, on the grip zone on the skis so you can get a good kick. 
and the toe is the only part that's hooked into the binding, right? That's right. Yes. Okay, so the heel is loose. There's a heel plant zone where your heel comes back down, but then your toe of your boot goes right in here and it grips your toe and yes. gives you uh, yes. the momentum there. And yes. of course, a set of poles. Set right? of poles. Nice pair of poles. Made in Michigan. <laughs> and usually, I don't know if this is uh, still true, but usually kind of the poles are a little bit longer than maybe people think of down for downhill skis, right? They come yes. under your armpit or mid-shoulder, right? Mid-shoulder. For, for the classic technique, it's mid-shoulder. And then for the skate technique, which we'll talk about in a minute, run right around your chin to your top long, of your shoulder really to your chin. Really long. Okay, yes. so let's talk about that because this is a ski that you would use for classic, classic skis, skiing. which is a groomed track, parallel track, that yes. you set your skis in and then you can glide. Yes. There's a whole other style called skate skiing, skate which skiing. I know you do, and the skis are a little different, right? Right. The skate skiing technique is really, a lot of bikers and people who like fast type of skiing will want to go fast all the time, and they're roller skiers or they're roller bladers, hockey players. They really like that fast, adventurous type thing. So these kind of skis are more of that type. Yep. Um, you can see that they're a little shorter. Yeah and they don't have as pronounced of a tip on them. They're mm. a little li lighter. And again, they have no, no fish scales, no fish scales yeah. because it's all glide on these. Yeah. And they're, these are also a, a real fun pair of skis to ski on because you don't have to really choose a lot of different waxes or kick waxes or anything like that. You can just get on these and ski. Just go. Just but go. you can ski faster. But you do need a groomed trail or a frozen lake. Oh, okay. Or a frozen golf course. And it's got to be wide because your skis are kind of out, splayed out, as like a skating motion, right? Yes, it's like All a right. skating motion. So real quick, tell me about dress. Like, because a lot of times, you know, even at uh, St. Joseph County Parks, where I work, I see people come in the first time and they have way too many clothes on. So what are your yes. tips for dressing? That's what I would say also, as I see a lot of people with Carhartts on and snowmobile suits, yeah. they go about 300 yards and they're already overheated. Right. And then they stop, they're wet, and then they get cold. cold right. So my rule of thumb is, before I start skiing, I should be just a little bit cold. Cool. Mm -hmm. And then go out on the trail, and you warm up, and you'll be just fine. But you can see that I'm dressed in basically synthetic clothes yes. and a nice vest that's waterproof and windproof. That's that's pretty much good enough to go right, right. there. And it, I, it's a wicking type of mm -hmm. a, a material, so you'll always be dry, and um, your heat will just dissipate on you and right. you should be good to go and then like a nice one of these things is yeah. really nice to put if it's cold put around you like this you can put it over your ears or your face when it was minus 22 last week all you saw was my eyes out here <laughs> so, whoops, so, just now, a <laughs> so, so anyway that's 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 uh for a nice hat to wear right keep your head warm keep your head warm sunglasses and i always Tell people really jeans not such a no, good thing. No, right? jeans are not a really good idea. Um, a lot of people will wear. You can still wear wool. Mm -hmm. Wool pants are yeah. good. They'll, those will keep you dry and right. warm too. Yeah. So. And if yeah. people want to try skiing for the first time, renting is a great option here yes. at Love Creek County Park. You can rent skis and the poles and the boots. I know Madeline Bertrand County Park, also um, in Niles, just over the Indiana-Michigan border, yes. rent skis. St. Patrick's County Park rent skis. And there's a lot of trails that are groomed in the area as well. Right, right. and the grooming is really fantastic in southwest Michigan. Uh, some of the best grooming conditions here yeah. is right at Love Creek. Right. It's, I got, I'm spoiled, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's a great way to get outside. I love seeing you know nature in winter, and it's just a great way to, as you say, get some exercise, get up, get off the couch, get some exercise, yes. yep. and enjoy the snow. There's nothing better than coming out in five degree weather and seeing the sparkly snow and the blue skies and the creek of the snow and the trees and it's all quiet. It's beautiful. Just, it's a wonderful time, it all really right. is. Looks like there was an opossum that has been walking around in the snow. I can tell it's an opossum track because they have an opposing thumb, just like we do. So the track shows one of their digits kind of poking out to the side, and it looks like it traveled along in the same direction that we're skiing. There's some poison ivy vine climbing up this black cherry tree. 
You can really see in this uh, winter light those really thin brown tendrils gripping onto the bark. That's pretty cool. Well, I really had fun skiing with Blair. He loves cross-country skiing, out here especially, and he is just full of enthusiasm, so that was a lot of fun. And I got to taste a tree bud, which I didn't know I would be doing today, but that was pretty fun. <laughs> yeah. I got to learn some tips on how to identify trees in the wintertime when there aren't any leaves on them. Which is great. Did you like the fat tire biking? It was cool. It, it's, uh, it takes a minute to get used to, but it's pretty cool. It's a neat, comfortable ride. I hope we encourage some folks to try yeah. it, right? Yeah, all good. Remember, you can find your own outdoor elements when you visit area parks and nature centers. See you next time. For more information on this and other episodes, go to the Outdoor Elements website at wnit.org backslash outdoor elements. Catch up on recent episodes and find additional resources like hands-on activities and informational PDFs. It's one more way to help you find your own outdoor elements when you visit area parks and nature centers. Elements is made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you.